going to talk about rocks this morning. And how fast rocks... I've mentioned this quite a few times, actually, how fast rocks can grow. And I keep talking about that because, well, first off, the Institute for Creation Research in their magazine, uh, Creation Ex Nihilo, keep bringing it up because it's an issue that happens over and over. Yesterday, we were on a hiking trip with some international students. And one of the couples, David and Jane, who are uh, graduate students at UNH, happened to go to the flume in Franconia Notch, and they saw the video that said, well, it took 400 million years for these rocks to form, to form Franconia Notch. So this is something that the world is constantly bombarding you with. Secular scientists are constantly trying to tell you that it takes millions and millions of years to make a rock. Well, here's a picture here of a pipe, and I'll, I'll walk up the, the aisle. I'll leave, I'll leave this magazine out back. It's a pipe, and that's not scale. That's rock. And it took three months to do that. Picture of, of a pipe full of scale. All right, I won't leave it out back. I can't get by that. I'll put it up front here. Afterwards, if you'd like to look at it and read it, it took about three months. This is a gas pipeline in Australia. They put the pipe in, and three months after start of operation, the flow dropped down to about zero. Puzzled, they tried cleaning it out with a variety of solutions, and, and uh, nothing worked. So they actually took the pipe apart and found out what they had was rock. Ordinary, old-fashioned rock. The pipe filled, not with scale, but with rock. And it took only three months to do it. Rock does not take millions of years to form. This is a calcium carbonate type of rock, like stalactites and stalagmites. They form very quickly. If you go to Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, they'll tell you that it took... I don't know, what was it, 500 million years for these, these stalactites to, stalagmites to form? The answer is, of course, that's wrong. That's not true. It can form very quickly. It depends on the concentration of the solutions and all kinds of things like that. Well, here's another example of it not taking a million years to form a rock. It took three months to fill a pipe with rock, hard rock, not scale, cannot be brushed out. It's just plain rock. So when God says in his word that he created the world in six days, that he means that he created the world in six days. And I believe that he created the world in six days. So there's another example of how reliable God's word is. Thank you. Interesting that People are always looking for an excuse to say that the Bible's wrong, or that the Bible contains error. Well, the Bible says that the people of Israel, when they were given certain foods to eat and to not eat, were not to eat rabbits and the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you, and the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean. Well, by modern definition of chewing the cud, scientists are saying, wait a minute, the Bible's wrong. Rabbits don't have the extra stomach that an animal has that chews the cud. But on the other hand, rabbits do something that's very similar. They do re-chew their food. In fact, they do it so regularly that Linnaeus himself, who was the father of our naming system in science and biology, considered the rabbit to be a ruminant. Didn't know, I guess, that it didn't have the extra stomach, but he classified it as a ruminant. It also turns out that rabbits do something else. They practice something called refection. Biologists talk about refection, when an animal throws up its food and then re-eats it. So in a real sense, from the biblical definition, a rabbit is an animal that re-chews its food. And once again, the scripture is right. And those of you that are in school or studying biology, if anybody tells you, uh, uses this as an example, and my son is laughing, he's in school, studying or trying to study biology. <laughs> One of his tougher classes, I think. But the Bible's wrong because clearly a rabbit is not a ruminant, uh, then they're wrong. Because a rabbit does rechew its food even if it doesn't have the stomach. And by real definition, 
is re-eating its, its stuff. It also throws up stuff, refection. It throws up its food and eats it again. Aren't you glad you're not a rabbit? The Bible is right once again. Thank you. Yes. Anyway, uh, so I, I had heard about this some time ago. What is it that makes you age? Well, time, right? This is, <laughs> hi, Doris. <laughs> and welcome. I'm so pleased to see that you're here, by the way. It's, uh, two lovely ladies here. But there's a, there was a very funny kind of funny, well, strange, ironic story. A French lawyer struck a deal about 30 years ago with a woman who was already in her 80s. And the deal was that, let's see if I get the deal right, uh, she could live in, a, in her house rent-free all her life and he would pay her a monthly stipend, a particular certain fee. Have you heard about this? And he figured, I've got it made. I'm going to have this house for almost nothing. She can only live three or four more years. Well, she turned out to be one of the oldest living women in the history of France. She lived to be 123. <laughs> he, he blew it big time. He got to be very, very old. She did, I mean. He died before she did. <laughs> That's a true story. So the question is, what is it that causes aging? Bacteria don't age, they just divide. So why do we get old? You know, and we have, in those of us that are involved with creation as, as, as a ministry, have always believed, well, after the flood, the earth changed dramatically. And there's some truth to that. That is true. And we have a lot more radiation now than before. But there's been some research done that, that kind of shows things a little bit differently. Scoffers have said from the very beginning that the Bible ages are all wrong. Adam could not live to be 930 years old. Noah was 950 years old. Did you know that? He lived for 350 years, or about 300 years, after the flood. So there's a little bit of question as well. Is really, is it the radiation that causes you to age? Well... It turns out that we've learned a little bit about that. In your genetic code, in your chromosome, a chromosome is a bundle of genes. At the end of a chromosome is a little cap. They compare it to a shoelace. It allows the cells to divide. They can divide so many times. Around 90 to 98, they think. After it divides for so many times, it stops dividing. In fact, it's called a telomere. The cap is called a telomere. And a woman in Australia won the 1998 prize in biology for Australia, an Australian prize for discovering how this telomere works. So the reason that I look like this now, and I look quite different uh, 40, 50 years ago, and we're looking at my old high school pictures, some of our, well, and some of her old pictures when before we were married, and to... Uh, of course, actually, in, in, in our case, we hardly changed at all. But, uh, <laughs> it's because that we can only divide so many times. Your, your, your organs can, the cells within your organs can only divide so many times. Then they stop dividing, assuming that, that you avoid having an accident. There is a limit designed into you, the world thinks, by evolution, and you know by God at this point, when God said that the age of man shall be no more than 125, there's a limit designed into you. And it's the caps on your chromosome. Well, the key is, scientists are now starting to say, gee, if we could solve that problem, we could live to be 900 years old. So all of a sudden, all the scoffers, all these years that I've struggled with scoffers saying the dates in the Bible are wrong, nobody could live to be 900 years old. Now scientists are saying, maybe you can. If we can just figure out how to stop that little cap from unraveling so that every time your cells divide to make a new, a new cell in your, in your liver or your, your whatever, pancreas, that it could keep going and it won't unravel. So scientists are actually now saying, you know, maybe it's possible that you could live a lot longer. Probably the reason that we don't is that God had a very small population after the flood, and genetically we lost the ability to live to be 930 years old. In the millennium, this is exactly how God could, if he so desired, 
solve the problem that we know that for a thousand years people will be born as regular people and will not die. He could prevent this cap from unraveling like that. He designed the cap. He can redesign it at the snap of a finger. So the point of all this is the Bible's not wrong when it said that Abraham lived to be 900 years old. Science is just catching up with what starting to catch up with just a little fraction of what God knew already. You could live to be 900 years old if you would if your, if your chromosomes were just slightly different. Just slightly different. God knows what he's doing. Scientists now think you can live to be a lot older. And what they're doing is confirming the book of Genesis. God's word is true. Thank you. Creation Magazine is a beautiful article about the human body. The human body, your body, is an absolute miracle. It is a fantastic and beautiful testimony to the design of God. Look in the mirror and what you see back is a beautiful and awesome thing, even if you look like me. <laughs> the very fact that your body functions the way it does. A few things that, that really kind of moved me as I read through this article. Everybody here has a, probably, or pretty close, has a car. Or as I would say, car. Car. I still can't use my eyes. You have to lubricate it. You have to do regular oil changes. If you don't, the engine will seize up. <coughs> and Carl's got one that the, the front wheel is kind of loose. And, and uh, Well, things wear out. You have to lubricate it all the time. You have to add lubrication. You have to do something to it. Your body has joints in it, much like the steering knuckles on a vehicle, that are lubricated by themselves. Think about it. The body lubricates itself. It manufactures its own substance at exactly the right place at the right time. Your body lubricates itself. As you get older, when you get to be my age, when you stand up, things clunk and creak from time to time, or they don't work quite as well, or they hurt, but it does lubricate itself. Amazing. A testimony to design. The body is designed to function a certain way, and it does it, and it does it for a long period of time. Very few cars will last 80 years. Very few cars will last 100 years and function. Your temperature, the control system, if you have a leak in your radiator, the car breaks down, it overheats. Your body is able to maintain its temperature through perspiring in the sweat glands, through pumping more blood to the surface. Think about that. Think about the computer control system required to do that, to automatically pump more of this warm fluid near the surface of the skin. Ought to, pump, ought, to, ought to open the pores up and cause evaporation to maintain. You stop to think about what a miracle it is and what a short and small temperature fluctuation is allowed. My wife has discovered that if you're 94 degrees, below 94, you start to have, you start to have body function problems. You know, our normal temperature is around 98, 98.6, I guess, is the official. I'm not sure they still agree with that now. We, we've learned some interesting things recently, my wife and I through some health problems of her own. But, but a very short range in your body can do that. And the pump, the heart. You know, Guy works for the Navy, I worked for the Navy. One of the things that we had to do that I was responsible for, well, I had trim and drain pumps for a while, pumps that move water back and forth in a submarine to the, from the front end to the back end so that it doesn't go like that or go like that, they can stay level. These pumps last for just a short time and they wear out. Your heart forces blood through, as it says here, thousands of miles of blood vessels. It pumps on the average, well, they have this in, in liters here, which is, but basically, every minute, it pumps one and a half gallons a minute, your heart. 50 gallon, 40, 50 gallon drums in a day. 40, 50, that's, that's 2,000 gallons in a day that your heart pumps. That's amazing, and it does it for 80 to 90 years. My father-in-law just celebrated his 90th birthday. For 90 years, his heart has been pumping 2,000 gallons a day. Think about that, and it's still pumping. Your body did not happen by accident. The very concept that you could have evolved out of a bag of gas, or from a bacteria, 
And that's what, that's what the Big Bang theorists believe, that we, uh, the first part of the explosion was just hydrogen, or that you came out of this primeval slime and a bacteria all of a sudden popped up into a, a multi-celled creature like us. It's ludicrous! It's poor science! You'd flunk any science exam if you offered the same valuation on research that you were doing. It's so dumb. As Dr. Ken Hovind says, are you dumb in any other area? <laughs> Your body's not an accident. It did not design itself by evolution. Your body is an instrument of careful, intricate design. It does amazing things. I didn't even mention the brain. We're going to be talking about that later. The brain is more complex than any computer. It's an amazing gadget up in here. And even if you don't use it a lot, it's, it's still pretty powerful. Think about your body and what an evidence for design your body is. Look at the way that it works. Even I know even Charlie has problems with his. He came in with a bag of nuts and bolts one time and said, they took this out of my shoulder or something like that. But it's still an amazing body. It still functions. It still works. Think about that. Thank you. There's a, a cute little article in the... Actually, this has been around for a while now. I haven't got my new creation magazine. This is uh, September, November. About the age, they did some dating on a qualified, if you will, tree stump. And they came up with some funny ages. And I thought I'd go over just a little bit with you. When they do carbon dating, everybody's heard of carbon dating. You know how that works. Carbon-14 is an unstable isotope. Carbon-12 is the way that carbon normally exists. That's six protons and six neutrons. Well, nitrogen in the atmosphere, the air is full of nitrogen, gets bombarded by radiation. And nitrogen, which is seven protons, seven neutrons, when the new, uh, an extra neutron hits it, pops out a proton, and you got t an extra neutron in there. It's unstable. Well, it turns out that carbon-14 changes fairly rapidly, uh, geologically speaking, to carbon-12. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years, which means that it should be very accurate for up to about 10,000 to 20,000 years. They don't try to use it over 30,000 years because the half-life is so quick. That sounds very strange, doesn't it? But 5,700 years is real quick, geologically speaking. So now you get the setup. That's how carbon-14 is supposed to work. It relies, though, on the assumption that the ratio of this unstable carbon to regular carbon in the atmosphere has been unchanged for millions of years. Well, that's not quite the case. They've shown that it has increased. Carbon-14 is increasing. Well, here's what they found. They found a stump in a coal bed. Did I cause that? <laughs> and they... This stump comes from a period 250 million years ago. So they sent the stump and its bark, all qualified, to a place in Boston to do a carbon-14 evaluation, a carbon dating evaluation. And they came up with the age of 33,700 years. Well, they scratch their heads about that and say, whoa, wait a minute, there's a problem here. This thing comes from something that's 250 million years old. But they say it's only 33,000 years old. So this is a problem for them. And then they go into a little bit of discussion about what the problems are with, with, with radioactive dating. The point is, radioactive dating is flawed. It's faulty. It relies on assumptions made by man. And those assumptions are not always true. They now know for a fact that carbon-14 is increasing in its ratio to carbon-12 in the atmosphere, which throws all the dates off. So even by their own techniques, and by the way, the lab it was sent to was a lab in Boston, in Cambridge. They didn't tell them where it came from. So they got some real numbers. Well, 33,000 years is much too young. So now it's a problem. This cold stump is a real problem because it's in a layer that's 250 million years old. You, however, being the intelligent scientist that you are, have a handbook in your pews, I hope, everybody has one, 
If not, go to a motel. There's one in every room in every motel in the state of Maine. A handbook that tells you exactly how old things are within just a few, you can guess, within a thousand years anyway, it's not focused on that. But you know that nothing is 250 million years old. You're too smart for that. You have the words of the great scientist, God, who made it clear that he created everything in six days. And looking through the scripture, it's pretty clear that it cannot be older than anywhere, take a guess, 15,000 to 20,000 years in that range, between 10 to 20,000 years perhaps. So you know better than this. You wouldn't even be dumb enough to get involved in this stupid argument. Is this dump 250 million years old? Of course not. Is it 33,000 years old? Well, that's closer. <laughs> it's probably more like 4,000 years old or 3,000 years old. The dating techniques that scientists use are terribly flawed. They really don't know how old anything is. They go up and down all over the place because they, they are based on assumptions that nobody can verify. What is the carbon-14, carbon-12 ratio 33,000 years ago? Don't know. Therefore, your technique is flawed. The Bible is not. Trust the scripture. The scripture does not have to be rewritten to, to, to take care of things like this. Now they've got to deal with this. Maybe their period of 250 million years is wrong. Trust the Bible. The dating of science is flawed. Starting at verse 1. The kangaroo court. We're familiar with unfair trials, aren't we? In this day and age, the tendency is for people that are guilty to have all the breaks, to not have to pay the penalty that they deserve. Well, here's a case where it was all wrong. It wasn't fair. The Creator being put on trial by His creation. The Sustainer being put on trial by those that He sustains every breath of life in Pilate is because of Jesus. Whether Pilate knew it or not, didn't matter because of Jesus. But this is the most significant trial. A trial that you need to praise God for. And take this point with you. I have one major point this morning. Because Jesus did not get what he deserved, you don't either. Keep this thought. Jesus did not get what he deserved, therefore you don't get what you deserve. Let's look at the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 1 to 11. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, ex except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greatest sin. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll look at these verses. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you this morning for your holy scripture. I thank you for this trial. 
I thank you that this trial was unfair. Because, but because this trial was unfair, Lord, we have salvation. And Lord, I, I know this morning we're going to be doing a Holy Communion. We're going to be sharing in the remembrance of the body and blood of Jesus that we are about to read about being shed here. And Lord, I thank you for that. This is a special day and perfect timing that we should be talking about this court and this trial right now on the same day that we will be doing our communion. Thank you, Lord. We ask you to touch our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Had the Creator beaten. Think about that. God the Creator being beaten by His creation. Jesus offered no resistance. He went along with them, do you remember? When they arrested him, he said to Peter, legions of angels could come and rescue me right now. But he was here to do the will of God. He offered no resistance, as was predicted in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. And we'll be looking at Isaiah once in a while this morning. I offered my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. As prophecy, Jesus offered himself to be beaten. He offered no resistance. He's the one that sustained their very life, and yet he offered no resistance. He also trusted the Father completely. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that. And I, in Isaiah 50, chapter 50, verse 7, Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He trusted the Father completely. I have set my face like flint, the servant says back in Isaiah. 800 years later, Jesus does it. He offered himself to be beaten because he trusted the Father. Do you trust the Father? Do you trust God? Do you trust God that he can save you? It's interesting how problems seem to pop up from time to time in a particular group or gathering, I guess. One of the issues that has bothered some people this, well, I won't say this morning, but in this church, and not just one person, is the issue of salvation by grace and how does works fit into that. One family in particular I've been on the phone with, we, we have resolved, I think, most of those problems. The Holy Spirit has resolved them. But then I got a letter from another person asking the same question. How does works fit into this? It's a matter of trust. Do you believe God or not? Do you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins? It's that simple. If he did, there's nothing you can do to add to that. If he did not, you and I are in big trouble. It's that simple. When you fly in an airplane, you're putting a lot of trust, not just in the pilot, I'm an engineer. I'm going to take a... <laughs> the riveter. I'm going back to the designer. At the University of Michigan, I was fortunate enough to take a course a few summers ago in finite element analysis. In fact, the, at the University of Michigan, Dr. Bill Anderson is the head of the finite department, and he was one of the developers of finite, as used in the aircraft. goes back to Boeing back in the 50s. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of mathematics and... and computer iteration techniques, iteration techniques. It's, it's a way to calculate stresses that you couldn't do any other way. It involves thermodynamics. The whole system involves thermodynamics and calculus. You put a lot of faith in the person that designed that plane. And you know what? If you, you went to help him, you would mess it up. You would probably want to put a steel beam in there. See, there's all metallurgists get involved too, and physicists. Turns out a steel beam in the wings would fatigue. 
and the wings would fall off eventually. Turns out aluminum doesn't fatigue. So many things. The one thing the designer does not need is you looking over his shoulder, <laughs> telling him what to put into that plane. Because it wouldn't work. On a very serious note, the, the young man taking care of my father-in-law has had to resign. He needs a heart transplant. And not just a valve repair. He needs a whole heart. It's very frightening. When he has his transplant, assuming you could get by the pain, the one thing he does not want to do is to tell the surgeons, wait a minute, I want to stay awake because I want to make sure that you stitch things together properly. They know what they're doing. At least we pray that they know what they're doing. That's a very serious thing. You and I don't. First off, I'd faint at the first sight of my heart anyway. We trust the designer of the airplane. And if you got involved, you'd mess it up. We trust the surgeons. Brother Ray is going to have to trust the surgeon. And if he got involved, he'd mess it up. Trust Jesus. If you got involved, you'd mess it up. Do you really trust him? Jesus trusted the Father. Do you trust Jesus? This issue of, of grace and works would never come up. I really believe if you could simply trust God. He doesn't need your help to save you. He did it himself. You could die on the cross and it would mean nothing. Well, it would to you. You'd be dead. But it wouldn't help anybody else. I could die on the cross. It wouldn't help Phil or Armin or Barbara. Do you really believe? Trust Him. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, we find out that this beating was for us. Think about it. The incomparable love of God. 53, verse 4. Surely He had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. He died, not just died, but was beaten for us. He died for us. This punishment that Jesus was taking as a result of this kangaroo court, which was unfair, was for me and you. Think about that. Verse 2. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. <laughs> the creator of the universe and these little ants are mocking him and striking him. Very dangerous thing for them to do, by the way. We're going to close the sermon this morning with the, the flip of the coin in Revelation. Don't mock God. Very dangerous. But He is King. You know something that they didn't know. And you know something that much of the world today doesn't seem to know. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. He is King. Indeed. Much of, I, it amazes me, for by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is Jesus. The soldiers were right. He was the king of the Jews. They didn't realize he was also their king, and they didn't realize that not only is he the king, he's the one that causes the authorities to be. He is king. He has a unique position. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, we see that everybody will recognize that someday. In 
And these are very famous passages. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will be very obvious to everybody in heaven, on earth, everywhere, that Jesus is King. And this mocking in this trial will be a forgotten part of our memory. The error here is mind-boggling. Jesus is King. And again, he allowed himself when he was struck in the face. He allowed himself to be disfigured. In, in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 14. It was of his will. He trusted the Father. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured but beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. He allowed that himself as predicted. Verse 4. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Jesus was perfect. Absolutely perfect. There was no charge they could bring against him. This whole trial is unfair. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 we see that's just one of many places. It's not the only place you could go. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, you see that Jesus was perfect. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeding of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Sin. A few years ago, when this movie, The Temptations of Christ, was going to be shown from nationwide, quite a furor. I wished I had saved it. I guess I didn't. A local pastor, I won't tell you which church, but a local pastor in a great big church, big in size, gave a sermon. It was printed in the Journal Tribune. It was given in the General Tribune and shown not as a letter to the editor but as an, a, an example of the kind of attitude that Christians should have in our society. <clears throat> in this sermon, and it was word for word, in the newspaper, this pastor said, we don't know that Jesus was sinless. He could have been having an affair with Mary Magdalene. We don't know. <laughs> uh, blasphemy, number one. Number two, he knows. If he doesn't know, it means he's never found the Bible. I'm not making this up. My wife will verify this. It was in the paper. Wished I had kept it quite a few years ago. That man's no longer here, by the way. But I don't think he's gone because they were upset with him. We talked to somebody from his church that thought it was a wonderful sermon. Couldn't see the problem with it. Well, tell you what, if Jesus is a sinner, his death means no more than your death. What a horrible, horrible thought. It also means you've thrown the Bible away. There's a website that I found through Phil. It's religious news summaries. And every day in the mail, in the email, I get listings. I've signed up for that. It's available to anybody that has email. But they also have a website that you can go read things that they don't send to you. Well, there's an interesting, very interesting discussion between a pastor from a Southern Baptist church which happens to have his head screwed on straight and a woman in Indianapolis in a Barnes & Noble bookstore. She said, Oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not dumb enough or arrogant enough to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. <laughs> she doesn't have any idea. Then she goes on to say, my son-in-law and my daughter took me to church with them once and said, it's a horrible church. The pastor preached that people without Jesus are bad. He said, I will not listen 
I'll go to any church that tells me I'm bad because I know that I have innate goodness. What makes you think that? Where does that come from? Larry Stromberg said years ago, the one doctrine of the church that you don't have to prove is the doctrine of sin in man. The newspaper proves that for you day after day. You prove it to yourself. I prove it to myself. Never mind the newspaper. No clue. If you think you are innately good, and now you're on the way to maybe trying to save yourself, but if you think you're innately good, you don't understand what the Bible says, and obviously she doesn't, about sin. My wife was getting ready for a Sunday school lesson, and she said, asked the question, how do you answer? If we're, if, can you live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is no. It's very easy. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 is the starting point. You can't even say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. And what do you do about people that, well, they, they lead good lives, they do good things, and they don't believe in Christ. Well, who says they're good things? What good things? How do you define that? Number one, Jesus has asked you to share the gospel. If you don't believe in Christ, you can't share the gospel, so there you have it. You've got a big problem right there. Number two, you have no idea when you're sinning or not sinning. Have you ever been angry with somebody? I'm sure you have. I have. Have you ever had a lustful thought at one time or another? Poor Jimmy Carter. The, the press crucified the poor guy. All he said was, yes, I've lusted in my heart. Well, at least he kept it in his heart. The president we have now has I mean, put it on his shirt sleeve. Hasn't he? Jimmy Carter's heart was in the right place. He was just being honest. And the press just had a heyday with him. For some reason, the press loves the one we have now. I do not figure, I cannot figure it anyway. That's neither here nor there. Have you ever envied your neighbor and the stuff he has? I mean, it goes on and on. You're not even aware of the, the very, you, know, you can't even start to think of the things that you're doing that are not pleasing to God. You can't even start. And number one of all of it is having a relationship with him, which is Jesus. No, you need the Holy Spirit. And you need to understand, Jesus came to put up with this, not as an insurance policy for you in case you couldn't do it, he came because he knew you can't do it. And if you're honest with yourself and look in the mirror and look into your heart, you know very well you can't do it. You need him. That's why he put up with this right here. Verse 4. Excuse me, 5. <clears throat> when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Well... Interesting, isn't it? These are the religious people. These are the people of God. These are the chosen nation. This is Israel. Israel wanted Jesus dead. Isn't that interesting? Religious people can be blind. It's like this lady, back to the Barnes and Noble bookstore debate with this, this pastor and this woman. She called herself very religious, but she was totally blind. Could not see that she was a sinner. Could not she, see that she was innately bad. That means by birth, inwardly. You know, you're just plain, ah, not good. You've got to get that concept, because you aren't. But it doesn't stop there. God loved you anyway. Yeah. Religious people often get very confused. We were talking this morning in the Sunday school about some of the confusion of religions. We're talking about our communion, which we're going to be doing this morning. I came out of a church background for a long time with two of the major uh, denominations of the world, I guess you might say. They go back a ways. Where there's a lot of confusion about what's going on here. That the bread becomes the body. The juice becomes the blood. That you receive the Holy Spirit through this act. Confusion that you're saved by baptism. 
confusion that your sins aren't forgiven until you go to confession. Hmm? All kinds of things that are wrong. You're not saved by baptism. Scripture's clear. You're saved by Jesus. And it, as Brother Phil will be sharing, this is symbolic of the blood and body of Christ. It's not the blood and body of Christ. You are, in fact, the temple, the living temple of Christ. Religious people get very confused. Well, they just couldn't see, could they, these people? They just couldn't see. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. <coughs> but their minds were made dull. But to this day, the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. It's only in Christ that the veil is removed. It's only in Christ that you can understand the Bible. The people that say, well, I read the Bible, it makes no sense to me. Well, of course it doesn't. It's only in Jesus that it makes any sense. That's what the scripture tells us. And we need to keep that in our mind and be very gentle and loving towards our friends and neighbors who do not know Jesus. If they haven't accepted Christ, they don't have a clue. Of course they're going to think that homosexuality is normal. Of course they're going to think abortion is okay. They don't have a clue. Of course they're going to think that premarital sex is okay. They are clueless. They're just going with the wind, blowing back and forth with the wind. Whatever society tells them, whatever society agrees is, is the right and wrong. It's society that establishes the mores. Really? What a horrible thought that is. They don't have a clue. We need to keep that in mind as we deal with our friends and neighbors that don't know Jesus. And we need to start, just as the Institute for Creation Research has been saying this since they were formed 25 or so years ago, don't attack abortion. Don't attack homosexuality. Don't attack whatever, fornication, or divorce. Go back to the Bible. They need Jesus. It is understandable only if they accept Jesus Christ as Savior. They have to see Jesus. They have to see that this trial, as much of a kangaroo trial as it was, is their salvation. Verse 7. The Jews insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. I want to take the time to go back to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, where it says, quite frankly, don't take God's name lightly. Leviticus 24, 16. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him, whether an alien or native born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. See, there's no exclusion here. Even if you're not of Israel, even if you're an alien, you don't take God's name lightly. So that's important. You don't take God's name lightly. You don't take God lightly. And that's exactly what Israel was doing. They were taking God lightly. They had the very Son of God in their midst and they took it lightly. They saw His miracles. They heard what He said. They knew in their hearts, I know, that He was more than just a man. They knew that. In fact, <laughs> Caiaphas, hmm, they said so. Caiaphas said, He's got to go. He's going to upset the apple cart. He's got to go. Verse 8. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. Pilate was superstitious, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus made no defense. He gave him no answer. And this is in fulfillment of prophecy in Isaiah 53, verse 7. We're told that. It's exactly what the servant's going to do. That's the verse that... Uh, we started to read this morning. <laughs> My fault. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He made no defense. And why should he? Jesus is God. He understands that it wouldn't do no good. I had a friend. His name was Bill. He's from Greece. 
very, very strong Greek Orthodox, did not accept creation. Just, just, we evolved, that's it. Apparently the Greek church has no problem with that. He even went to talk to his pastor in the Greek church and said, oh no, this guy's a fruitcake. He thinks that God created us. Every time I talk about creation, he would argue with me. I think I mentioned that to some of you here. And I, we used to pray for him. His real name is Vasilios. So I called him Bill. After a while, I wouldn't talk to him. He would come into my cubicle, lay down a comment, and then I'd ignore it. And I said, whatever you say, Bill. And he said to me one day, you're not arguing with me anymore. How come? I said, well, it's crazy. I said, first off, it's close to blasphemy. You don't have any concern at all about learning the truth. You just come in here to just, just raise an issue, start an argument, and walk off laughing. They're trying to make me look stupid, and I don't care. So I do that myself. And he said, nothing. He walked off. But a few weeks later, he came back in. He says, I have a question. I said, no, I told you, I'm not going to talk to you. He said, no, 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 seriously. We started to talk. And as the months rolled by, he did start to listen. Well, Jesus knew this. What, what could he say to Pilate? Pilate is so clueless, so far out of it. It's absolute, and, and Caiaphas, and I don't know. There's nothing. Nothing. Jesus knew that. Not to mention that it was also prophesied. But he knew that there was no reason to talk to these people. They're so far out of the stream, they couldn't even start to deal with the truth that he would tell them. In fact, he does start to tell Pilate something. And Pilate, right over his head, verse 10. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? What a laugh that is. By the way, I hope you don't think you have any power. Go back to the young man that's taking care of my father-in-law. You have no authority or power over your body. There's nothing you can do. I mean, you, 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 can, you can exercise and diet and all that kind of thing. You're still going to die. Verse 11, Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. There are two major points there. Number one, all power, all authority comes from God. And I won't turn there, we've done it so many times lately. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit tells us, all governments, all authority comes from God. And in fact, Colossians 1.16 said the same thing. Jesus created them. Pilate is clueless. That also is predicted. But he will understand later in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. There's an, a very interesting statement. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. The shoe is going to be in the other foot. The kings will not speak up. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, shall they consider. There's going to be another trial. This isn't the last one. This is the first one. This is a trial where, the, where God himself was put on trial. The creator was put on trial. He did not get what he deserved. There's going to be another trial where people will get what they deserve. Revelations chapter 20, just one verse, verse 15. This is what we call the, the white throne ju uh, judgment. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, bear in mind, you are not a part of this. Jesus will come back, as we're told, in Scripture, Jesus will come back before this. You and I are part of the church. Those of us that can say, Jesus Christ is Lord, Romans 10, 9, and believe in our heart in the resurrection of the dead, will not be a part of this judgment. We're not standing here. But in this particular judgment, there's no screaming, there's no yelling, there's no plea bargaining. 
No one's going to get off because they forgot to read him the Miranda rights. Hmm? It's like the O.J. Simpson trial. It's, it's the biggest farce of the century. They even interviewed the jurors and most of the jurors believed he was guilty. It became a racial issue. Not here. Not here. Automatic. And it's not just a one month punishment. If you're not in the book of life, and you won't be, <coughs> because you're in heaven with the Father already, with Jesus already, you're the bride, you're, part, you're, you're, you're the church, you will be called long before this judgment seat. This is not your judgment seat. Anybody that's here, they're in big trouble. If you think, I, I'm going to rephrase that. None of you will be there as long as you believe that the death of Jesus, the blood of Christ, and his resurrection was adequate payment for your sins. You will not be there. If you believe that you've got to help Jesus out because what he did was not enough, you're in tough shape. Read, read, read chapter 20. That's all about you. That's what this is about. It's about your life. If you think that you need to help Jesus save yourself, this is for you. But if you have put yourself in the hands of God, if you have confessed, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I am not good, but you love me anyway. That's what it's all about. It's about love. And God, I don't understand it, but I know that, that when you, you look at me, you see the righteousness of Jesus. Can you say I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior? That's the key. I've given myself over to Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. And of course you have a regenerated lifestyle. I understand that. Peter talks about that a lot. Your life changes. Paul talks about it in Romans. That you're being conformed. Your life is changing out of love because you want to serve Jesus. But there's not a thing you can do to save yourself. Two trials. The first one is over. Jesus did not get what he deserved. Perfect man, the Son of God, put on trial by his own creation. And he put up with it for you and for me. The next trial they're going to get what they deserve. And if you and I do not accept Jesus Christ as Savior, what we deserve is exactly what's going to happen to those people, eternal hell. That's what you deserve. It's tough. I understand. This, this is a very unpopular message. The people of today's world do not like to hear this. They just don't. But that's Scripture. And that we have nothing else to go on. Thank you.